In terms of our next speaker, I'm thrilled to announce uh, is John DeVries, for who is the CEO and Managing Director of ASX listed BlackRock Mining. John's career is vast and expansive with over 35 years experience in mine development and operations. His geographical experience is equally, if not more expansive, having worked across Africa, Australia, the Pacific, the former Soviet Union, North and South America. Uh, prior to joining BlackRock, John held numerous roles, senior executive positions, and he was previously the general manager of technical services with St. Barbara, and he was integral in their turnaround in 2014. And he had earlier operational roles with BHP, Nickel West, Orica Mining Services, and Western Mining Corp, amongst others. So very keen to hear about BlackRock's progress, Fari Graphite's progress in Tanzania, and John's perspective on the market. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, Honourable Commissioner, Honourable Ambassador, um, and everybody. This is probably the biggest session I've seen for a Tanzanian presentation in uh, my time at ADU. So it certainly bodes very well for our collective future. I want to just quickly walk through state of play where we are at BlackRock, and by, by, by definition, BlackRock also means FARU, which is our, our joint venture operating company. At the end of the day, this is all about the ore body, and at Mahingi, we have got what we think is a total world-class ore body. It's big, 200 million tonnes of resource. It is reasonable grade at 8.5%, but critically, it produces a, a super clean con that we know is in demand. We know it's in demand because we're building out our channels to market and POSCO, who are here today, a critical part of that build out of channels to market. We're also able to put this together in a, in a business model then unique to Tanzania that delivers us a bottom of the cost curve, low carbon intensity business. The role POSCO plays here is absolutely critical. POSCO comes on board as our biggest shareholder um, standing in the market for all of the offtake for the fines from Module 1 and on Monday we announced an MOU whereby POSCO would be taking up further options uh, around fines for Module 2. So it talks about POSCO's ambitions to build out a supply chain in the alternative energy space and it talks about Tanzania's <coughs> capability to step in and support that build out of that supply chain. Key government agreements are in place. Uh, for that, that means their framework agreement, and it means that's also framework agreement is now translated into a special mining licence. Framework agreement's interesting. For us, it's year two. Uh, we're, we're in the second year of the framework agreement, and I think, in all honesty, it's taken everybody a little while to work out how to work with these, but uh, as we get better with practice, and we're certainly seeing um, a strong leadership from the government now to make the framework agreements work. And they're actually a really good instrument. Um, I note last night at dinner, um, the President of Namibia talked about equal sharing. Um, for those who, who don't know the framework agreements, fundamentally a 30% tax rate, 4% royalty, 16% free carried interest. And it gives you about an even split of the economics of a project. Um, and uh, it's a surprisingly robust formula. Um, would tend to, tend to end up 50-50, whichever way you, you cut it. So that's in place. And uh, the final part, uh, we've talked a lot about the debt process. Um, clearly, the uh, MOU with POSCO probably put some crumbs on the ground as to where we are with the debt process, but we are confident that we will be able to talk about uh, term sheets in the not-too-distant future. We put all that together. Um, it's a very substantially valuable project, not only to our shareholders, but also to Tanzania. Uh, and in terms of joy to people, I want to bring some joy to my shareholders. It's been a bit of a tough couple of years, I tell you. People matter. Um, we have a, a small board, but it's a unique board. Across our board, there's like 100 years experience. Um, in our board of three people, and that's more mining experience and sits on the BHP board. Um, so we've got the right people on the board to make a difference. But if you're in the financing, this is where you start to really lean on your C-suite. And you look at our C-suite there, starting at the bottom, we've got Ray. Ray's been pushing the ESG bit. Now, if we're going to go attract debt, the first thing 
the debt providers will want to know is, are you going to compromise our brand with an environmental issue? So you need to be ESG compliant. It's a binary outcome. You're there or you're not. And particularly in our case, you need to be IFC compliant, you need to be EP4 compliant. Greg's pushing our commercial activities. So part of this is we need to do power purchase agreements with Tonesco, we need to do rail agreements with Tazara, we need to do port agreements. All those take time, people need to do that. They need to be in place as part of your debt process. Paul is pushing uh, the overall debt process um, and you know, doing a very good job on that. And then finally, we've got Daniel sitting there. Daniel um, is Head of Engineering Technical. Again, if you're going down debt, you'll get audited independent technical review, and they will go down every nut and bolt in your project. And what that means for us is we've got a guy who actually was project manager at Sirius Balama project. So not only do we have somebody who knows about graphite, but we know somebody who's built a graphite project in, in, in Africa here. And final part of that, debt is good, but you need the equity, and that brings in Stu. So that's as a, as a team, we actually have been completely flat out in the last 12 months pulling this together. And uh, it's, you know, like I said, we're about to pull it all together in the not too distant future. So it's a very, very exciting part of the company's growth. Just want to put POSCO into perspective here. Um, POSCO is the largest anode producer outside of China. This is in a market where China controls you know, 90 per cent of the global anode supply, and the biggest, biggest one outside China is POSCO. And to give a perspective of POSCO's ambition, um, investing something like uh, $93 billion between now and 2030, that's real money, that's US, not Pacific pesos, 46 per cent of that capex is sitting in the lithium-ion battery value chain. Now, clearly, if you're going to go into that, you need to ensure that you've got a supply chain into your business. And you can understand the perspective there. The fines off Module 1 is 30,000 tonnes of flake, um, and yeah, POSCO could do an order of magnitude more material. So certainly I'm expecting to see more, uh, more integration of POSCO into other people's projects as we walk this forward. What we're really talking about with POSCO um, is an integrated supply chain. Sounds a little bit strange, but mineral processing is a team sport. We've got miners, we've got millers, we've got people who are final assemblers. It is unusual to find a single entity that's vertically integrated, and what we are really doing with, with POSCO is developing an ecosystem of like-minded people to work through this. Now, there's an overlay of the Inflation Reduction Act and the European Critical Minerals Act. We don't know how that's going to play out yet. That's still a work in progress. But uh, potentially that does give us a bit of a head start in some of the, some of the tougher to crack markets of the, of the US and EU. It's a particularly exciting time to be in graphite at the moment because if we look at the analogy where lithium has gone through the roof, lithium went through the roof when we started seeing about two thirds of the demand of lithium going into the lithium ion battery. We are very close to that tipping point in graphite. Um, and if you put the overlay on top of that of potentially constrained markets into the US and the EU, very, very quickly we can get to a tipping point where graphite moves into deficit and, and given the qualification delays of bringing a new project on, that deficit takes going to take a while to work its way through. So we're, we're quietly excited about the opportunities in front of us because we can see um, effectively you are pushing against an open door. So why Mahengi? More importantly, why Tanzania? Um, for, for all the projects I've done, this is absolutely blessed. Tanzania is currently commissioning the Nairi Hydro Scheme, a two gigawatt hydro scheme. Um, so we are long on clean hydropower. We need to build, as part of our project, a 70 kilometre power line from Ifakara into uh, Mahengi. That'll deliver power to us at a nominal price of about eight cents a unit. But Tanzania's got best in practice in terms of this is that we build a power line, we hand the power line over to Tonesco. Tonesco then turns around and writes us an IOU power to the value of the power line. It doesn't get any better than that. That's a really good outcome. We've got rail at Ifakara. Rail goes into one of the biggest container ports in East Africa. That's a 24 million tonne a year container port. 
um, you know, it really starts to come together. So it's, it's more than a story of a fantastic ore body. This is a fantastic ore body surrounded by world-class infrastructure. You, know, you don't get this infrastructure everywhere. What that infrastructure means is it translates to where we are on the bottom of the cost curve. Eight cents a power in our business is the difference between quartile one and quartile four. Eight cents a hydropower gives us low carbon intensity product, gives us preferential market access. So this is a, a story of Tanzania and the geography of Tanzania delivering us a preferential position on the cost curve. A little bit about graphite pricing and, and where we sit at the moment. We've seen graphite pricing coming off a little bit over the last 12 months. If I restate that in Chinese or in NIMBY, the graphite price is flat. That is actually a story of Chinese depreciation as opposed to um, constraints in the, in the graphite market. What particularly works for us is uh, our product is a, is a large flake product, so 70% of our material sits above plus 100 mesh, so we start to see uh, our basket price is well above that minimum minus 195, which is the material that goes into batteries. Now, there's a little nuance in here for, for the bankers. It's really tough to hedge graphite. You can't because graphite's not fungible. But the worst case outcome you can do is sell it for minus 195, and we're still at minus 195, $200 a tonne above our cost of production. So whatever we do, we're always going to make money. And if you start thinking about that air gap between POSCO's ambition and where we stand at the moment, 30,000 tonnes, clearly there is no doubt that we'll be able to ship every piece of product we make off this project. So we pack and wrap that. What does it look like when we bring that together? $1.4 billion US MPV. 350,000 tonnes per annum. We start at about 90,000 tonnes per annum, take the cash flow from that and, and turn, grow it into the business. A couple of really interesting points here. It's $182 million. That is an audited number. So when you go to the banks, you do an independent technical expert, they go through that number in a great deal of detail. So very confident about that number. $1,700 a tonne consensus expert price deck. At $1,700 a tonne, this project is bringing $3 of revenue in for every dollar of cost. If I use a gold analogy, this is a $700 an ounce gold mine, and a big one. 26 years life um, and plenty of upside there. Um, we, we don't need any, any additional reserves. There's a, a massive project, massive NPV. Uh, we think it's been monumentally de-risked through the debt process um, and the geography puts us at the bottom of the cost curve. So there's a lot of boxes getting ticked there. So I'll pull up there now, um, try to deliver the project in ahead of schedule um, and in full and hopefully in a not too distance fully financed. But um, we, we sum that up. It's a great project. You don't get them this big this often. You don't get the the ability to, to leverage that infrastructure that we, we access to. We think the experience team, uh, the relationship with POSCO, the modular approach to the project really starts to, to come together and, and de-risk the project from an execution. And particularly the effort that we've put into ESG, uh, we know we are EP4 compliant, we know we're IFC compliant, that really starts to open up opportunities into North American and European markets. Um, where, you know, potentially you are going to be market constrained. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, hopefully next year we'll be here with our construction photos.